3 through 14. So look with me at this marvelous, long, complex sentence, Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. And we're remaining standing out of reverence for God whose word this is. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us, in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through jesus christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word of scripture. We thank you, Lord, for the heights to which Paul's theology in this verse, in this, in this sentence, to which the height to which his theology ascends. And your glory is practically shouted out Lord, would you do something in our hearts this afternoon as we hear this word explained? Would you cause our hearts to respond? Lord, like, like well-tuned musical instruments, responding to the melody that we hear. Would you cause our hearts to sing, Lord, with your blessing, with praises that roll out of our mouths, Lord, from our hearts, minds filled with your glory, your majesty, your grace and mercy that we would praise you, Lord, with everything that we have. Father, we ask, in short, that we would respond to the blessings that we discover in these verses. We would respond by blessing you, by speaking well of you, by declaring your excellencies, by declaring your goodness, by praising you with hearts full of affection and gratitude, by sh uh, sharing with others, Lord, what we have found to be true in you, that we would not only speak well to you, but well of you, we ask this, Lord, that we would be a people in whom your glory and your grace is reflected. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. I want to remind you again, although when we gather at our normal uh, gathering place at the uh, James Bay Community School Center, we take up an offering normally at this time in the service. We're not doing that these days for obvious reasons. But you can still give to the ministry of Beacon Church. There is an offering box at the very back of the room there. And if you are in such financial need that you desperately need to steal that offering box, I guess you can do that. You might need it more than we do. But please don't. Please uh, consider what God puts on your heart to give to that. And there's envelopes there that you can mark and your offering will be recorded. I want to thank you for being with us. For those of you who've come out this afternoon, uh, there's uh, close to 50 of you here. And those of you who are tuning in from home, we're happy that you're joining us by this live stream. Uh, we're continuing in our sermon series in the book of Ephesians, and uh, you can see that we've got two sermons now down on our website, and this is the third one as we continue in the book of Ephesians. Last week I preached on the first part of these, this sentence. How many preachers do you know who dissect a sentence and preach two sermons on one sentence? Well, I guess I'm not much of a preacher. Uh, I needed two sermons to cover this sentence by the Apostle Paul, and this is part two. So it's, the title of this sermon is Why You Don't Like Church, Part 2. Why You Don't Like Church, Part 2. And, and those who chuckle, I can tell that you didn't listen to last week's sermon. 
because the title has surprised you. So you can find that on our church website. Why you don't like church, part two. Where does life come from? I thought I'd begin this evening with a sort of a superficial question. Where does life come from? The woman who wrote Frankenstein, uh, Mary Shelley, apparently had no idea. Her main character vaguely talked about gathering unspecified chemical instruments and utensils and called them the instruments of life that he might infuse a spark of being into what was lifeless. And you can tell she has no idea how life could possibly come about in that way. The reader is supposed to use his or her imagination to fill in the gaps as, as you read that terrible book. I don't like the book Frankenstein. The movies are even worse, but the book was bad to start with. But the thing is, life is easier said than made, right? All the body's systems need to function well in order just to sustain life, just to keep it alive. For example, the circulatory system moves blood and stuff around your body. I'm being very technical with the word stuff. The circulatory moves blood and stuff around the digestive system, processes the stuff we eat. The endocrine system makes hormones. The immune system defends us from all kinds of stuff, viruses and bacteria and you name it. The lymphatic system, I'm still not sure, but it does something important with stuff called lymphs, and apparently we need it. The muscular system makes stuff move. The nervous system doesn't make us nervous, apparently it makes stuff work. The skeletal system, without which we would just be blobs that sit there. It's important. The reproductive system makes more stuff. The respiratory system... <sighs> the integumentary system, which I have no idea, this is the last but not the least of all the systems in the body, the, integu inter the integumentary system. Skin. It holds all our stuff in. So that, you, did you know that the human body is a roughly 50% water? Without the integumentary system, we'd just leak all over into puddles on the floor. It holds us in, it, it contains all of us. Every day, the 100 trillion cells in your body are kept alive by 20,000 breaths of air. By the 50 gallons of blood your kidneys filter and process every day. Most of your body is made of oxygen and carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen, but there are 54 other chemicals found in the body, chemical elements, and scientists still don't know what they all do, what they're all there for. What makes it all live? Well, we could ask the same question, and, and, and I am, about what the Apostle Paul later calls the body of Christ in Ephesians 4 verse 12, that is, the church. What makes a church live? You know, you could put a bunch of people in a room. Check. We've done that. You could give everyone a Bible. Well, we didn't do that because of COVID. We could teach this group of people some songs. We could get someone to drone on at them for about 45 minutes. And we could pass around the bread and wine afterwards, but that doesn't make this group of people a church. And that might explain why so many people find church so utterly boring. You can't just make a church by having all the right ingredients. It might explain why some congregations seem comatose. Have you been to a church like that? I have. I've been one of those comatose people on more than one occasion as the pastor and his voice gently wafts me down the road to sleep. And I said last week, my dad would reach out and grab my knee with his iron grip of a hand and wake me up, you know, roughly 
uh, uh, harshly, unpleasantly from my dream. Just a few verses after what we just read, the Apostle Paul tells the people in this church in Ephesus, the people this letter is written to originally, he tells these people that you were dead. You were dead in the trespasses, in the trespasses of your sins and in which you once walked following the course of this world, Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. But then something happened. Something happened. You were dead, but something happened. Paul says, but God, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive, Ephesians 2, 4 and verse 5. So a church that is alive, I don't want to sound like a mad scientist who says, it's alive, but I did. A church that is alive, my friends, is made up of people whom God has made alive. Has God made you alive yet? How would you know? If you don't know the answer to that, maybe, maybe that's why you don't like church. Remember what brain death is? I shared a quote with you last week from the UK's National Health Association, whatever it's called, where they talked about how to diagnose brain death. It said when, when there's unconsciousness and, and the patient fails to respond to outside stimulation. And that's not a bad way to diagnose when a church is no longer alive. It fails to respond to outside stimulation. The outside stimulation we're going to see in this, in the, in this sentence, later on in this sentence, in these verses, it comes from God, that outside stimulation. It comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces what no theologian probably ever has called a spark of eternal life that many theologians would agree that creates, that quickens, that animates, that regenerates sinners, spiritually dead people, and makes us living worshipers of God, that makes us responsive to God. And without the Holy Spirit to do that, we don't respond to God. My sermon last Sunday was part one of my attempt to preach these verses, this long sentence in verses 3 to 14. But this might be the most profound sentence ever written. These verses, verses 3 to 14, in any language. This might be the most glorious sentence ever put on paper. I describe the big idea of these verses by saying Paul tells us four things that God has done to get us responding to God with blessing. That's my theme still this week. Just like last week, Paul tells us in, this, in these verses, in this sentence, four things to get us responding to God with blessing. Four things that God has done to get us responding to God with blessing. Would you forgive me if I said some of you look like you need to get responsive? So I'm hoping that Paul's words here will affect you this afternoon. This sentence can be kind of like an automated external defib defibrillator, an AED, an automated external defibrillator, you know, the paddles in the ER, where they, they clear, and they rub them together, and they put some kind of gel on the patient, they zap them, and, you know, boom, and everybody stands back. This, this sentence can be like that for you, unless there's no spiritual heart beating in your chest. If you remember, I had said that the writer of Ephesians, this is the Apostle Paul, he was trying to stir up his readers so that they would bless God. And you can see that in verse 3. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, and it's like a, he's, he's like saying, join me in this. Let's do this together, he's saying. This is the kind of language it is. He's saying, let's do this together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord. He doesn't want to say this alone. He doesn't want to be the only voice in the choir. 
He's expecting when everybody reads this long sentence that they would all be joining him in verse 3 and saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. When he writes, blessed be, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, he's telling his readers that God deserves to be blessed by us. God deserves it. He deserves it when we praise him and when we thank him and when we speak well to him and when we speak well of him. He's the only being in the universe who has always deserved that. Do we ever really give it? Paul writes, blessed be, because God deserves to be blessed by our words. That you and I should speak from our hearts about God like this, like Paul does. That we would be responsive to God and we would praise God and thank him and lift our voices in blessing to God. From verses three to 14, Paul uses four key words, four key verbs actually, to describe what God has done. In English, they don't all seem like they're verbs, but they are in Greek, so I'll just tell you what they are. Paul tells us four key words that describe what God has done to see if we're gonna to respond, to like see if there's any signs of life in us, to see if we're gonna join him in, in responding and blessing God from our hearts with our mouths. And here they are, these four key words that Paul uses to describe what God has done. First, verse four, God chose us. Second, verse seven, God gave us redemption. Third, verse 11, he gave us an inheritance. Fourth, verse 13, he sealed us with his Holy Spirit. And today we're looking at just those last two. In Jesus, God gave us an inheritance. And in Jesus, God sealed us with his Holy Spirit. So my sermon has two points tonight, which means it's going to be much, much shorter than your average sermon from me. The first point here is we should respond to God's sovereign grace with hope. I see this in verses 11 and 12, if you look at those verses. Remember, this is the third thing that in this whole sentence, in these verses altogether, that Paul says in these verses, God has given that should cause us to respond, that should cause us to respond to God back with blessing. In verse 11, Paul says, God has given us an inheritance. The first part of verse 11 goes like this. In him, who's Paul talking about there when he says in him? I hear the word, but it's like you're not quite sure. Yes, it's Jesus. Of course it's Jesus. Paul says in him, in Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance. An inheritance. There are churches and there are Christians that I've met who seem to talk like, really, that's all Jesus gave us. Just a ticket to heaven. And life doesn't change much now. We're just waiting for the sweet by and by to cross the Jordan, as it were, and enter the promised land. And in the meantime, well, we're just like other people, right? No. In him, we have obtained an inheritance. And if we really understand that, it should change everything. We have obtained this inheritance. Notice the tense of that. We have obtained it. He means this happened because of Jesus. It was by becoming united to Jesus in faith, in him, Paul said, in him, in him. Picture it. Christians are in Christ. Somehow, that's what Paul's saying, in him, we have obtained an inheritance. God the Father has adopted us into his family, co-heirs, spiritual siblings with Jesus Christ. So in him, we now have obtained whatever he is going to inherit. That's a marvelous idea. Adopted as children of our Heavenly Father, co-inheritors along with Jesus Christ of all that God has planned to give him. 
If you want to read more about that, look at Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and see what the Son of Man inherits, and then keep reading down and see who, it, who he gives it to, to the saints of the Most High. In him we have obtained this inheritance. And just think for a minute about that inheritance. Just, just think for a minute about what that inheritance entails. When Jesus was getting ready to say goodbye to his disciples, he didn't just tell them that they had an inheritance coming. He told them he was going to make sure they obtain it. Listen to those words. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. But then he said, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. There's not much uncertainty in that statement. Do you hear that? Jesus is making sure his disciples will get to enjoy what he's going to prepare to what he's going to prepare for them. John 14 verse 3. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about eternal life. He's talking about glory, about paradise, about the new Jerusalem. He's talking about the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells, says Peter. He's talking about the promised land, the heavenly city, the kingdom of the Son of Man. Amen? Amen. That's a great inheritance. And Jesus promised it. He promised And if Jesus makes a promise, you don't need to do a credit check on him. You don't need to see if he's good for it. You can take his word for it. He will surely do it. And that's why when Paul says, we have obtained an inheritance, in verse 11, he doesn't say we might obtain it. He's saying it's for sure. You know what? Thank God. Thank God when you or I, when we have a bad day, when we mess up, when we commit a sin, when we commit a transgression, when we commit some iniquity against God, it does not put our inheritance at risk. Because Jesus promised. Thank God, our eternal future depends on something stronger than us. It depends on something stronger than our good intentions. It depends on something stronger than our efforts or our willpower or our faith. It depends on the word of Christ. And he will surely do it. So Paul says, we obtained our inheritance in him, that is, in Jesus. And look at why Paul says this is a done deal. In verse 11, right in the middle of the verse. Having been predestined. The grammar goes all together. In him we have obtained an inheritance. Having been predestined. According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He says we were predestined. Now, in a lot of churches, them's fighting words. The Greek word here means God decided on it beforehand. He determined it in advance. Why would God do that? Especially knowing you and me. Why would God do that? Doesn't he know the things you've done? Doesn't he know the things you're doing? Doesn't he know the things that I've done? Why would God do that? Doesn't he know what sort of people we are? He knows. He's always known. His predestining choice to give you an inheritance in Jesus was not because he thought you deserved it. So you can like just rest easy on that score. 
Stop thinking you've got to somehow keep deserving it. He didn't think you deserved it. It was not because he thought you were good enough. So again, what a relief. Because we aren't, right? It wasn't even because he thought you would eventually choose him back and make it worth it. Or you would accept his gift or you would put your trust in him. Verse 11 says, God's predestining predetermination to include your name in his will that is, in, in the list of those inheriting the kingdom through Jesus, his son, it was doubly determined. Look at verse 11 and see twice, he says, according to, according to. It was doubly determined. It was according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. You know what? In, that, in this debate, there's often a, a tension between God's sovereign plan and free will. Look at verse 11 and tell me who has free will in verse 11. According to the counsel of his will, do not let your pride of what people are limit God's freedom. That's not blessing God. That's not taking him at his word. I know this is complicated stuff. I know that there are all kinds of questions that we want to ask and talk about afterwards. But take the scripture at face value, will you? Don't water it down and make God less than God. There are two guarantees of God's choice, his predestining, predetermining choice to give you an inheritance in Jesus Christ. It says, according to the purpose of him, according to God's purpose. He had a purpose in it. And then it says, according to the counsel of his will, which is another way of saying it was according to what God had in mind. The counsel of his will, his internal thinking about it. The thoughts that God thought and the things that God wanted. Paul responds in another passage to this idea by saying, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Romans 11, 34. And then he says, And all the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. He is praising the mysterious workings of the mind of God. Because he chose us. But let me tell you why I'm going to be that bold this afternoon. I'm going to tell you why God predestined every single one of his undeserving children for an everlasting inheritance in heaven. I'm going to tell you God's reason. Verse 12. Look at it with me. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. See, it says we who were the first to hope, right? I want you just to simplify this and say whether someone was among the first to believe in Jesus, among those earliest disciples and Jewish believers, or whether someone believed later on when the gospel began to spread, when the good news began to travel to other countries and other nations and other peoples and other languages. Verse 12 says the first ones who hoped in Christ were, notice it, to the praise of his glory. But then notice what it says in verse 14. It goes on to say that those who believed later were also to the praise of his glory. Whether you were first or last, it's to the praise of God's glory. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. We'll not collect the offering and go home. <laughs> I'm not done. So the thing you need to remember here, and I think this is very practical. Again, you need to take what the scripture says and bank on it. Build your faith on words like these. Because when we sit there in our shame, and we sit there in our humiliation, and we sit there knowing we've blown it, knowing we're just not measuring up, we need to remember what the scripture says. We need to call to mind again when we are convinced that no one can love us, much less God, that he did it to display how praiseworthy his glory is, to the praise of his glory, 
He had a higher purpose than just you. And that's reassuring. But let's not skim past this without asking the, that embarrassing question, the big elephant in the room. How is God's glory shown to be praiseworthy by letting people like you and me into heaven? Notice why I'm, why I'm asking that question. Verse 12 says he did it to the praise of his glory. Verse 14 said he did it to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. Praise. He intends that his glory would be praised as a result of his predestining, predetermining choice to give us an inheritance in Christ Jesus. How in the world does that make sense? How does God's glory get praised because he chooses people who don't deserve to go to heaven to go to heaven? Good question. Well, isn't it true, according to the scripture, that God took the initiative to love us while we were still deep in sin? Yes. Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So isn't it true that Jesus died in the place of sinners, of weak people, of ungodly people? Isn't that what the scripture says? Yes. Romans 5, 6 says, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Then isn't it true that the scripture says that for God to love us would be the same as for God to love his enemies? Meaning that the things that we've all done are the kinds of things we would do to an enemy. And we've done them to God. Isn't that what the scripture says? Yes. Romans 5.10 says, but if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. It's all true. It's the best story ever told. It's the best news any ear has ever heard. It's all true. And someone has said, you are more wicked than you ever realized. But you are more loved than you ever dreamed in Christ. And how merciful does God's mercy seem now? And how gracious does God's grace seem now? And how forgiving does God's forgiveness seem now? I'll tell you, in a word, praiseworthy. Praiseworthy. By saving people like you and like me, God has displayed to the whole universe what he is like. He has shown his glory and the response of all creation will one be to praise his glory. He has shown his glory through the gospel and his glory is praiseworthy. Verse six says, to the praise of his glorious grace. Do you see that in verse six? Notice it again in verse 12. It says, to the praise of his glory. And verse 14 repeats it, to the praise of his glory. I said this inheritance is the third thing. The third thing God gives in this long sentence, in these verses. The third thing, this inheritance he is sovereignly predestined. It should be the third thing that makes us respond with hope, which respond with blessing to God. And this hope that it gives us, it should be hope that perseveres until we get the inheritance. Right now, we've already legally got it, but we don't have it in our hands yet, but we will. So we need to persevere until then, and God's going to make sure that it happens to the praise of his glory. Jesus promised it, and he will deliver on that promise. So the hope that we need to respond with here to God's inheritance that he's given us is persevering hope. It's 
Hopeful hope, not wishful hope. It's a totally different thing. Hope that perseveres until the end of our glorious journey. Because the fourth and final gift from God in these verses that Paul mentions is why, it's the reason why our hope should be more like a flame than a flicker. It should be more like confidence than like cautious optimism. I hate that word, that phrase, cautious optimism. That's not optimism. That's pessimism dressed up. The hope that we have should be like a flame that's alive, that's confident, not in what we think, but in who God is, not in what we hope for, but in what God has promised. So my last point, because I'm closing now, should be this. We should respond to the Holy Spirit with praise. We should respond to the Holy Spirit with praise in verses 13 and 14. That's where I get that idea. Look with me at those verses. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Are you seeing why I think this is the most wonderful sentence ever put on paper? When you read this, when you read this about the, this promised Holy Spirit, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, you should have one question burning through your brain. Have I received the promised Holy Spirit? That should be the big question you're wondering. When Paul first arrived in this city that he later wrote this letter to, the city of Ephesus, he ran into a group of disciples and he asked them, I don't know exactly how you start a conversation like this, so I think it was probably after some conversation at some point, he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, and I quote, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Acts 19 verse 2, you can look it up. That really happened. So Paul shared the gospel with them because they hadn't heard there even is a Holy Spirit, which meant they couldn't possibly have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit is kind of key to the whole good news. So Paul shared the gospel with them, and that's what I want to do briefly with you right now. I want you to look closely at verse 13. We're going to look at verse 13 and see that there are four things there in verse 13, four things that, that can happen to you today because of Jesus, or as Paul says, in him, in Jesus Christ. Everybody, everybody whom God has ever made alive, who has become a, a, a Christian in the deepest sense of that word, Everybody whom God has ever made alive has had these four things happen to them too. So if this happens to you today, you'd be joining a great company, a great crowd. First, you need to hear the word of truth. You see that in verse 13, 14. I'm getting my verses mixed up. 13, it's in verse 13. You need to hear the word of truth. Do you see that? That's the first thing you need to do. You know what? You, you have a lot of free will when it comes to whether you will listen or not. You can make that choice. You can plug your ears and do what Billy Crystal does on The Princess Bride. Na 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 na. Humperdink, humperdink. I'm not listening. Clearly, no one has seen that movie here. <laughs> okay, it's a good movie. It's worth seeing. It's not nearly as good as this, but it's a good movie worth seeing. You have a decision whether you will hear or not, whether you will listen or not. But the first thing that has to happen is you have to hear the good news. Paul says it right there in verse 13. Second, Paul calls that message the gospel of your salvation. Why would he call it that? Well, that's the good news. That's the good news. The word gospel means good news. Let me break that down for you. It is news that is good. But no one ever believed the good news without thinking that it was actually good news. 
That's the second thing that has to happen. You have to believe and see it and hear it as good. It has to strike your affections as good news. What is this good news? You need to hear the news that Jesus of Nazareth, the incarnate Son of God, was executed outside the city of Jerusalem about 1,990 years ago. About 1,990 years ago. And that when he was dying, when he was dying on that Roman cross, that means of the execution, God, at that time, poured out on him all of God's hostility, all of God's anger, all of God's wrath against all human sin forever and punished Jesus with all of it right then and there. And what makes it such wonderful news is that Jesus went to the cross of his own will, willingly. He did it voluntarily in order to take that from you, to take all of God's wrath, all of God's anger, all of the consequences, eternal consequences of your sin against God and Jesus voluntarily, willingly took it in your place so that there is no more wrath for those who say, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. There's no more anger from God for those who say, yes, Jesus, thank you for what you've done for me. All because he did it 1,990 years ago or so on that hill just outside Jerusalem. When you hear that, does it seem good news to you? That's the second thing it has to be. It has to strike you as good news, not boring news. And you need to realize that because of what Jesus did for you, you can have that salvation, Paul mentions. The gospel of your salvation. Third, the only way this good news will make any difference to you is when you believe in him, Paul says. You see it there again in verse 13. When you believe in him. And that means you need to accept that it's true. Yes, that's the first thing belief must do. You must accept that it's true, that Jesus really did that, and he really did it for you. But there's more to believing. You need to believe in him, that means to trust him. You need to put your confidence in him and actually think that he's good for it, that he'll do it, that he's able, that he's reliable, that he's a trustworthy place for you to put all your hopes that when you die, God will look on you and say, my child, not my enemy, my child. Because of what Jesus did for you that day, you need to trust Jesus. That's what believing in him means. And fourthly, you need to be sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. You need to be sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. But notice how verse 13 goes. Notice all those things that have to happen, those four things. And notice how three of them lead to the fourth automatically. When those first three things happen, the fourth one always happens. That's why Paul says it like this. You also, when you heard and believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. You were sealed when you heard and believed. You don't need to make it happen to you. Being sealed by the Holy Spirit is not something that you can do. It's something God does to you when you hear and believe. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit is what makes us alive. The Spirit is the one who makes us alive, I should say. The seal of the Spirit means our lives are beginning to change and nothing will stop it. The story is told of a young woman named Anne, way back in 1887, who took a job to go care for a seven-year-old girl who was totally blind and totally deaf. And apparently she was seven years old but acted like an animal in her rage and her confusion and her bewilderment about what was going on around her and her frustration. Can you imagine the frustration? Totally blind and totally deaf, no way to communicate, no way to understand. She was like, I quote, she, she was like, and I quote, a wild vixen who uttered unintelligible animal sounds. 
When in a rage, she would snatch dishes from the table and throw them and herself onto the floor. And more than one person had told her mother that her child was an idiot. So Anne took the job to care for her, to be her tutor. That's a brave person who just takes the job to be a tutor of a child like that. The little girl's name was Helen Keller. And 60 years later, here's what she herself wrote about the breakthrough that happened on April the 5th, 1887, because of that persistent creativity of her tutor, Anne Sullivan. These are Helen Keller's words. It happened at the well house, where I was holding a mug under the spout, and Annie pumped water into it, and the water gushed out into my hand, and she kept spelling W-A-T-E-R into my hand with her fingers. Suddenly, I understood. I reached out eagerly to, to Annie's ever-ready hand, begging for new words to identify whatever objects I touched. Spark after spark of meaning flew from hand to hand, and miraculously, affection was born. From the well house, there walked away two enraptured beings calling each other Helen and Teacher. Anne Sullivan quickly realized that this little animal-like seven-year-old girl that she was hired to tutor, that she was a child prodigy. She was a genius with an IQ much higher than her own. Helen quickly mastered, she mastered five languages. She went to college with her tutor interpreting for her and became the first deaf-blind person to ever receive a bachelor's degree. Her brilliance and the story that she had to, had to share became sort of like good news, and it spread, and it won her audiences with presidents and kings, and she became friends with celebrities like Alexander Graham Bell, the guy who invented the phone a long time before Apple came around, friends with Charlie Chaplin and Mark Twain, and all of that happened. Her life was changed. Because while Anne Sullivan was pumping water into that mug little Helen held in her hand, with her other hand, she was pouring insight and understanding into Helen's mind. And that picture of Helen's mind coming alive with understanding as Anne pumped that water into the cup, it's a beautiful picture, right? But it's nothing compared to the miracle that happens when you believe the gospel. It's nothing. It's lame by comparison in its effects on your life. As verse 7 puts it, the redemption through Jesus' blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, notice this, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. What does lavishing look like? like but, but pouring from heaven, which he lavished on us, According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. Can't you see that God's grace is already poured out in the person of Jesus Christ? It's already a shower of heavenly grace. And all you have to do is step under that flow. Step under that deluge of God's divine grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. Can't you see that these four gifts that God has given, He chose us in Christ. He redeemed us in Christ. He gave us an inheritance in Christ. And He seals us in Christ with the Holy Spirit. These are four gifts. And when eternal life comes, these gifts are what make us alive to God. And if we're alive... We respond to God like we've never responded before. We respond to God with praise. We respond to God with, with blessing. And from that moment that we begin to be alive in that way, with that new spiritual life, that eternal life, Jesus called it, from that moment when we are sealed by the Spirit, we will never again need to be afraid of God's wrath. We will never again need to fear God's punishment. 
We will never again ever need to be afraid of what's going to happen to us should we step out of line, should we go too far. Never again. God will take away forever that anxiety, that worry, that dread that we've offended God as long as we listen to the promise. And if you trust him, you will be sealed. Sealed. It, it, it means, it, like, done. It's completed. It's not in process. It's the finished work. He applies something to you permanently. In other words, you will be spiritually marked as belonging to God. Sealed. A guarantee that God will never let you go. God will never forsake you. He will never turn his back on you. He will never give up on you. Like the seal that a judge puts on adoption papers, it means that from that day on, you belong to who? To God. You are his child. And the result is a changed life. When the Holy Spirit was promised in the Old Testament, it was always a promise that God would give life, that God would make his people live, and God would produce change in them. Isaiah 32, 15 pictures like people like a, a dead lamb. Can you picture a dead lamb? Nothing grows. The dirt's like, it's empty. Empty of nutrients. It's just a desert. And Isaiah 32, 15 pictures God making that land live. And this is the promise of the Holy Spirit. It says the Spirit has poured out, the Spirit poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. And Isaiah 44, verse 3, God promised, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. This is what God has done for us. This is how God has blessed us. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So respond. Bless God back. Join with Paul as he says in verse 3, come together, let's do this together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Respond with Paul. Show that you're alive, that there's a heart beating in that chest of yours. Show that you've heard the good news, that you've believed it's good news, that you've believed it's for your salvation. And respond with the words of your mouth and the affections of your heart to God, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved, in our beloved Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I simply ask that your words would land on fertile hearts this, evening, this afternoon, that you would cause life to spring up, that you would cause deep repentance of sin, that we would remember and re recognize we have sinned against you, Father. That's why we need a Savior so desperately. And thank you for the Savior you have given, Jesus Christ the Lord. The Son of God became the Son of Man so that he could die in the place of sinful men and women. The Son of God took our sins upon his shoulders so that we could be clothed forevermore with his righteousness, with all that he earned, with the eternal reward, with the inheritance that he has earned that is coming to him and he has promised us not only has he gone to prepare that place for us, he will come again so that where he is, we will be also and forever. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this plan of salvation, this plan of uniting all things under Christ, of glorifying your own, your own grace, your own gospel goodness to the praise of your glorious grace, O Lord. We thank you that you've exalted your name and shown who you are. We bow before you. We confess our love for you. We confess our indebtedness to you. We confess, Lord, that we owe you more than we could ever repay. And we thank you for the freedom 
that you call us into now to live as children of yours. We confess, Lord, that we are foolish people, that we wander like just dumb sheep all the time, but you love us with an unfailing love, for you are faithful even when we are faithless. We thank you, Lord, and we confess that we depend absolutely upon you. Don't let us think that we can get by tomorrow, even an hour, without remembering you and turning our thoughts upon you and trusting in Jesus Christ. Let us be reminded how much we need your grace always. Lord, would we be people in whom your glorious grace is praised forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.